today I'll be talking about enhancing building energy and environmental assessment certification. For brevity's sake, uh, I've decided to make it succinct and just call it BAC, spelled B-E-E-A-C. So um, as Tim said, uh, my name is Emeka Ethel Saji. You can call me Emeka. And uh, this webinar and the slides in it represents a snapshot of uh, work I've been doing, you know, in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, it relates, you know, specifically at this moment to my doctoral study at Leeds uh, Beckett University. And uh, I guess you could say it's been so far interesting and I hope you would enjoy the webinar. So I started off by undertaking um, a study, an exploratory study of uh, the BAC tools around the world globally. And so far I've identified about 55 of such tools. Uh, this basically tend to focus on the design, uh, construction, you know, phases but then there are also tools uh, to do with certification rating assessments, which also tend to also focus on the operational aspects. But majority or primarily majority of these tools, uh, 55 of them over 78 to 140 countries focus on the design and construction phases. As you can see from this slide, um, there tends to be 13 of these tools, which have been used in, you know, most of the countries. And this range from the Green Globe, SPEAR, SB2, DGNB, HQE, the Energy Performance Certificates, which, you know, consist of uh, certificates which are supposed to follow the Energy Performance or Building Directive within the, what used to be the 29 uh, EU countries now with Brexit, probably 28 or 27. They have Energy Star, Well, Passive House, SQL, Dream, Edge, and Lead. Now you notice also from this figure that half of the top four, so which means um, SQL and Brain, happen to be UK tools. Now if we look at this slide, it gives you an idea of the countries using the most BAC tools. Now I would like to think of what I've captured so far is dynamic because a lot of knowledge in this area depends on the knowledge you can actually collect and which is readily available. So that's why I've referred to it as in at least number of countries or in at least number of BAC tools. So as you can see from this uh, snapshot of this slide, the tools, or rather the countries using the most tools consist of Australia, Czech Republic, Denmark, Finland, and the UK uses the most, about nine tools. I felt after the uh, global coverage of those tools to now try and create a focus. And that focus being trying to explore for instance, the UK's building energy performance timeline. The reason being, like I said, as you've seen from those earlier two slides, half of the top four global BAC tools are UK tools. The UK also uses, you know, more of such tools, BAC tools, when compared to other countries. Another thing, you know, one has to bear in mind is this global BAC tools share an underlying principle which is to try and facilitate transparency when it comes, uh, when, when it uh, involves uh, the design, construction, and operational aspects. Uh, of course, to also facilitate certification, facilitate rating, as well as facilitate efficiency. And this need, for instance, to explore the UK's building energy performance timeline is via an exploratory study you know, with the intention to try and identify any key issues that might emanate 
uh, despite UK's, you know, uh, prolific uh, use of PAC tools. There were several key issues, and you know, for brevity of this webinar, uh, I can't, you know, uh, show all the key issues that were identified in the uh, UK Building Energy Performance Timeline. But hopefully, via um, a brief report or document I'll share with uh, Tim and uh, the CBC Ashray Group, you might be able to benefit from, you know, that timeline. But one key issue that interested me was uh, the Energy Performance of Building Directive and how, for instance, within the UK, it's been transposed into regulation, so it's become law. And I guess that's what makes it important when compared to some other tools, because we have tools emanating from the uh, EPBD, which is the Display Energy Certificate, the Advisory Report, which, if you remember one of the slides earlier, I talked about energy performance certificates in the original 29 uh, EU member states. So it's become law. So it's interesting to see if this directive, so what exists in law in principle, is being translated into good practice as law. You know, not just as uh, some practice, you know, but as law. So it was actually transposed into UK regulations in England and Wales in 2007, amended in 2012. And of course, like I said, it's in response to the Energy Performance of Building Directive. Its principal aim, that's its underlying principle, like I said, with you know some of the other tools, is to ensure transparency, ratings, certification, and in this case with the advisory reports, which accompanies the Display Energy Certificate, the DEC, is to actually propose energy saving recommendations. However, in practice, and I mean, it's important to know, we always experience this tug of war between what exists in theory or principle and what actually exists in practice. So in practice, problems exist. One of that being non-compliance another being poor DEC ratings, another being the uncertainty regarding if this advisory report, this AL energy saving recommendations are being implemented. And even if they are, what's the extent? How, what's the coverage? How wide is the implementation? Or how wide is the success otherwise of such implementation? And then there's the elephant in the room, Brexit you know, Brexit, because the EPBD emanates from the EU. It's a directive which has served or was intended to serve well. So how will Brexit affect, you know, the implementation or existence of the EPBD? Even though uh, this April, there were some discussions regarding how to improve the EPBD. Now, I undertook a pilot study. And once again, I felt it's important to determine what's the process. Because before we start and arrive at point A and point B, there's a process involved. There's a process involved. So I felt it very, very important to actually identify what's the process involved in the display energy certificate and advisory reports, the DEC and AR, which is supposed to actually help facilitate the EPBD principle. So that's why I felt it important to establish the process flow. And by so doing, through the pilot study and consultation with stakeholders or key stakeholders, also I was able to identify where in the process the, pro the flaws actually lie. So as you can see from this slide, you have a process that starts with that underlying principle, like I said, transparency, certification, ratings, recommendations, and efficiency. Then you have the pre-commission, what I call the pre-commission requirement phase. So like I said, this is not um, some sort of choice, you know, this is an obligation, it's law. Then you have the commission, the production phase. So this is where new DECs and ARs are supposed to be produced by licensed or registered energy assessors who are affiliated with accreditation bodies. 
who then help with the lodgement of such DECs and ARs. There's also supposed to be some sort of quality assurance enforcement phase, as well as a complaints phase. And then, of course, the process, you know, restarts all over again with, you know, renewal of DECs and ARs. But then, like I said, I identified certain areas like with the uh, requirement phase, production phase, lodgement phase, and renewal commission phases where flaws exist. Reliance, for instance, on the supply of data and not really there being some sort of independent arbitrator regarding the reliability of such data. So basically, the energy assessor is, uh, um, it's, it's almost uh, at, at, at the you know, mercy of whatever data he or she receives. And then there are other issues regarding the catchment period, you know, that represents such data. Where, for instance, I discovered that the data which is supposed to be over, say, a 15-month period, a 12-month period data was actually being used, and certain data being replicated to balance out the missing gap of months, which don't actually represent the actual, you know, period of time uh, that's been measured or audited. So not taking into consideration actual occupancy details, weather details, etc. And then there are so many other issues, like I said, which uh, the documents, the more expansive documents I'll send later, will shed light on. So bearing all that in mind, um, I decided, you know, to analyze the government's compliance. You know, there, there are some societies that call it charity begins at home. So, um, you know, like I told you initially, the UK government, uh, for instance, in this instance, uh, representing England and Wales, was actually supposed to implement the directive as transposed into law in 2007, amended in 2012. So it's interesting to see if uh, those who are supposed to police, implement, and you know facilitate the system are actually being disciplined, efficient custodians of, of such a directive and system. So that's why I tended to actually analyze, start with the central government, analyze central government compliance, as well as later on, the national compliance with the local government authorities in England and Wales to actually see how they're complying with the principle of the DCs and ARs in England and Wales. The objectives, you know, basically are straightforward. First, identify how widespread the problems are. In the central government's case, with their 510 uh, uh, buildings within their uh, building stock, find out how widespread the problems are nationally in England and Wales with the over 200,000 buildings of 348 local government authorities. Identify why these problems you know, occur for central and local governments in England and Wales. And also to try and find out how can we resolve, mitigate, manage, address you know, this problem or this issue you know, for both practice and principle of the DECs and ARs. I had to go about it by setting up an appropriate protocol, taking into consideration a lot of the um, information and knowledge I was actually uh, collecting. So the protocol consists of a literature search and review of broad areas to take into consideration, you know, knowledge out there whether it be relating to energy performance, certification rating, the principle versus practice, and any assumptions that are out there. And that's why I referred to trying to go through to scrutinize the UK building energy performance timeline. Then I tried to address key questions also to take that into consideration in the protocol. So what's the principle, like I've already pointed out, the practice, so trying to reach out to stakeholders who are willing to share their practice and experience and expertise, the methods that have been involved, 
as well as literature research and review of focused areas, so in particular to the DECs and ARs themselves, how they are implemented, the content of those documents, and already, you know, for instance, key studies actually were highlighted. For instance, in relation to non-compliance with the DECs by Bronte et al., which identified a 20% non-compliance. Then there was also that two years later identified by Hong and Stedman through, I think, a CIPC study of a 50% you know, non-compliance. These are significant. Then also how to identify access to sources of information. As any of you know, when it comes to energy performance, tapping into reliable data sources is key and challenging. But luckily, as part of the directive, which is you know, a plus in the case of uh, the government of the United Kingdom, they were one of the first to establish as part of the directive, very good national registers. So much so there's a national register for England and Wales and also for Scotland. The non-domestic energy performance certificate register deals with non-bulk data. It's bulk in itself, but when compared to the open data communities platform, that is, you know, more bulk data compared to the to the former. Then also empirical research has to be taken into consideration regarding primary and secondary data. So taking into consideration any energy use patterns from historical energy data, as well as the documents themselves, the documents of the statute, statutory instruments, the DECs and ARs. And probably later, if qualitative studies are undertaken by me, you know, rigorous questionnaires to take into consideration whatever evidence has been uh, captured at the quantitative analysis stage. That also required a protocol. And that involved, you know, searching the DECs and ARs in England and Wales, trying to summarize any patterns within the content. This is still ongoing, of course. Then trying to address any questions, the key questions relating to non-compliance, the ratings, as well as the energy saving recommendations. Accessing the and the EPC register. And I have to go through a painstaking process of first trying to establish how many buildings, for instance, are within the central government building stock, trying to derive the addresses of such buildings in order to help retrieve and catalog the required or appropriate DCs and ARs from that register, that database. So, so far identified 510 central government buildings, but only 104 DECs and ARs were available to be retrieved and cataloged. And in later slides, I'll, I'll explain the significance of this. And um, bear in mind, the previous two key studies I talked about regarding non-compliance of 20% and 50%. I also was involved, again, like I said, taking into consideration historical data as well as uh, the DEC and AR data. And then undertaking content analysis, statistical analysis, and comparative studies. So what are the findings so far? And I'd just like to remind you, as Tim said, um, if you would like to drop any questions or feedback as the presentation goes on, um, you have the uh, uh, platform, you know, the interface there to actually type in any questions or feedback. So what are the findings so far? As you can see from this slide, and as I described earlier, I was able to identify 510 buildings belonging to the central government building stock. Only 104 were available in the database to be retrieved and cataloged by me. Now, there might be reasons, you know, the qualitative analysis might reveal eventually certain reasons behind that to do with perhaps 
security, etc. But then the directive says you either lodge or you have not lodged. So all we can do is basically observe and actually say what has been found, how many buildings have been lodged, or how many documents relating to those buildings have been lodged. So as you can see from this slide and the table, the DEC ratings range from A to G, A being the best, G being the worst. As you can see also from the second row, no building, no central government building got a rating of A. The most, 25 in fact, got a rating of G. Six were able to get a rating of B, but as you can see a lot had a rating of between E and F. As significant as that is, what's even more troubling is, like I said, 406 of the 510 central government buildings had no lodgement of DECs and ARs available. Now, when we dig a bit deeper into the different uh, demographics, the categories of these buildings, you now discover the central buildings have agency and other public bodies, high profile groups, ministerial departments, non-ministerial departments, the Prime Minister's office, number 10 Downing Street, as well as public corporations. And as you can see, the Prime Minister's office itself had a rating of D. Agencies and other public bodies, a B. Non-ministerial departments, a B. Well, as this table can show you, it doesn't look too good in terms of the DEC ratings. Again, in fairness, some of these buildings are buildings that are limited in terms of the sort of interventions or refurbishments that can be introduced. And that might suggest, the data suggests or might suggest so far, that those limitations actually prevent a lot from being done to actually improve the performance. And that again might suggest some restrictions in terms of being able to take on board the benefit of any AR energy saving recommendations in its totality. Again, in terms of the findings, we started off, like I said, with two key studies. One stating a 20% non-compliance in 2011, another stating a 50% non-compliance in 2013. My study has identified the level of non-compliance with the central government stock of buildings as 80%. That represent non-lodgement. Again, the study would eventually try and dig deep into the data qualitatively to find out the reasons behind this significant figure. Now the government has its what it calls its government property unit, its GPU. And this GPU itself in trying to facilitate efficiency, sustainability within the government estate, set the target of having the buildings achieve A to D ratings, so a maximum of D ratings by 2018, which happens to be this year. And my study shows that unfortunately, those government, central government buildings are only likely to meet this target set by its GPU, just by 42%. A lot of the buildings, like I said, fall within the cutoff D, but most of them fall out of that cutoff 24 within E category, 11F and 25G. So just 42% of the central government building stock would actually achieve its own target, its own 2018 target of A to D ratings.
Now, I also looked at AR recommendations for the worst DEC rating performing category of buildings, that's the G-rated buildings. And like you can see from the slide, bearing in mind that even the building research establishment, the BRE, has championed you know, the fabric first as a basic first intervention in trying to limit the number of mechanical and other you know, interventions. You can see from this table that a lot of the focus in terms of the uh, advisory report recommendations focused on assessment of the air conditioning systems, measures to reduce hot water usage, automated controls and monetary systems relating to, you know, of uh, sorts of electrical equipment, the energy management introduction into the uh, building management system and uh, strategies, a review of lighting strategies, you know, in terms of upgrades and whatever implementation plan for those buildings, and regular inspections of the building fabric now comes down the priority. Again, like I said, the qualitative studies are going to do next year might reveal, you know, give some insight into the reasons behind this, taking into consideration some of these buildings in the building estate are listed and might actually have restrictions in terms of the sort of recommendations that can be implemented or the interventions that can actually be taken on board. Bearing in mind what I've discovered, you know, at the central government uh, level, like I said, with the uh, objectives I set for myself, I decided also to set up a protocol to now quantitatively analyze what goes on at the lo local government authority levels, you know, across England and Wales. Again, bearing in mind, you know, the bulk data nature of this study is still ongoing. But it basically involves searching the DECs and ARs in England and Wales. Again, addressing key questions relating to the underlying principle versus practice. So, you know, the transparency, the compliance ratings, and the energy saving recommendations. Accessing, you know, I, I spoke earlier of the bulk data register or platform, data platform. So accessing the open data communities platform and deriving the information for 353 local government authorities in England, 22 for Wales. But then the nature of bulk data is, you know, if you remember, I talked about data reliability, data sourcing and reliability. We have to assume all data has to be checked, cleaned, and verified for any sort of data corruption or even data duplication. So I had to do that with 215,237 DECs and ARs for 348 local government authorities. And then I conducted the empirical research and also the quantitative analysis involving content analysis, statistical analysis, as well as comparative analysis of this bulk data set. So like I said, it's ongoing and I've started to go through it region by region. So for instance, if we take a look at the Northern England region, which consists of the Northeast of England, Northwest of England, as well as Yorkshire and Humber, interestingly where my Leeds Beckett University is located, you now have a situation where the table reveals 32 to 39% of this Northern England DECs will not also meet the GPU target of attaining A to D ratings by this year, 2018. Now, bearing in mind that of the central government is 42%. So we're beginning to see similar patterns here, which doesn't you know, speak well of uh, trying to identify good practice.
if we now look at the groupings of the local government authorities for England and Wales, so 353 for England, 22 for Wales, which is supposed to make up the total grouping of 375 local government authorities, we now discover only 348 local authorities had lodged these plenary certificates and advisory reports. So which basically I found those of 7.2. And then when we look at the different sub-regions of the Northern England region. Looking at their data sets, their lodgements. And when benchmarking this against the evaluation of this agency statistics, you now discover significant non-lodgements for each of these three sub-regions in Northern England. And which basically shows a similar pattern because the central government, like I said, had a non-compliance of 80%. I now begin to see similar patterns of 87%, 89%, and 88% for the Northeast, Northwest, and Yorkshire and Humber, respectively. So again, this is quite significant and begins to, you know, unravel certain patterns. Now, like I said, I'm going to painstakingly go through the quantitative analysis and eventually some qualitative analysis. And that's going to involve, like I said, all the regions and sub-regions of England and Wales. So like I said, going back to my objectives to try and determine how widespread the problem is, the discrepancy between principle and practice. And then there's also in plan, a plan rather, for a comparative analysis of the content, in-depth content of the certificates and reports themselves, based on parameters and variables, to now discover what's going on, what's missing. And luckily, with my consultation with the formerly known DCLG, now the Ministry of Housing, I've gotten the DEC and AR codes and subcodes, so which makes content analysis possible, even at the bulk data level, to really do scrutinize these documents, to see how they hold up, and compare that to the original intention from the EPBD. So the question then is, so far, the question then is, how can DECC likely be enhanced. So far, I've identified which still has to be validated and taken through a focus group after I've completed all the quantitative analysis as planned and qualitative analysis as planned. But so far, it does suggest the BAC can be likely enhanced by addressing the process flaws. There's no other way about it. Whatever flaws exists in the process has to be addressed. Also issues relating to the discrepancy, the challenge, the tug of war, the friction between the principle and practice also have to be addressed. And then also I've suggested, or I'm suggesting, what I call a process compliance re-engineering protocol, which basically means now we know, or eventually when we know what we know, trying to retrace the process to try and rethink and restructure it to improve the process compliance. But which is based now because when we acquire more knowledge, it gives us the opportunity to look at the process, you know, retrace the steps of the process, re-engineer it, with, with a clearer perspective or vision. It now gives us the opportunity to now be able to actually analyze, assess, review, scrutinize 
the process flow and process flow through better data capture as well as analysis. If we probably start with that, we begin to probably have a better chance of being able to enhance the BAC. But then enhancing it, what does that mean? Because like I had the chat with Tim and we both acknowledge how difficult it is to completely erase all issues, resolve all issues, and ensure the process never has any flaws. But then that's the ideal. But in reality, we're dealing with people, stakeholders across, like I said, with the BAC tools, 55 tools and counting, 78 to 140 countries and counting. It's difficult for a group, a body, number of people operating at different levels, different interests, different experiences, different mitigating circumstances to always achieve consistent, and that word is important, consistent, efficient, good, best practice. So that's challenging. So I thank you. I hope you're not taking up too much of your time. I thank you for attending and listening, uh, regardless of your locations and circumstances. Uh, I'm happy uh, because one of the reasons I did this was also to learn from you and get feedback, you know, based on your experiences. Um, I'm happy to take your feedback and acknowledge you're sharing it with me. But I also acknowledge if you're in a situation where you prefer some sort of anonymity, being anonymous, I'm also happy to um, extend that to you. But you can always contact me via the CFC Ashray group via my personal email or connect with me on LinkedIn. Thank you and uh, I'm very happy you attended today. I've got a, I've got a question here from uh, Tom in Sheffield and yeah. uh, he, he's just unsure about the difference between a DEC and an AR. Could you just inform Tom a little bit about that, please? Okay, um, the DEC is sort of the bread and butter uh, so to speak, um, certificate, uh, because it's seen as the main certificate which has to be displayed uh, by law and failure to actually have a large DEC and a displayed, a properly displayed DEC means you can actually be penalized. The AR, on the other hand, is still also a statutory instrument, but not required to be displayed but it provides, via the energy assessor's experience, uh, knowledge, experience, as well as observation and scrutiny of the uh, uh, building, provides energy saving recommendations which the building manager or building owner should take on board. So these two documents are alike because they are statutory instruments of the United Kingdom of England and Wales. But in terms of display of visibility, the DEC should be prominently displayed in a public, publicly visited or public authority building, whereas the AR should be made available on request, but not necessarily displayed. So the DEC, bearing in mind what I talked about, the underlying principle of the Energy Performance of Building Directive, the DEC fulfills the transparency certification rating aspect, whereas the advisory report uh, fulfills also transparency, but more fulfills the energy saving recommendation and also efficiency aspect. Okay, just just to clarify for people who don't know, because we've got people from around the world here, uh, DEC stands for display the energy, energy certificates. Okay, and and who has to who has to complete that? And and that's that's a that's a. Um, a target well not sorry that, that's prediction rather of what how a building uh, will work or is it actually um it's it's actual energy use no it's actual energy use that's why you know like when i went through the um uk building energy performance timeline the uk building energy performance uh, experience has been such that it's gone through you know the typical problem of data sourcing verifiability uh, as well as predictions but the unique thing with the DEC when it was introduced is it actually provided 
by law, mandated by law, that actual energy use should be made available. So interestingly, the central government complied, for instance, by making sure a lot of its buildings stream live their energy use data by an hourly or daily basis as well as ensuring other you know aspects you know they've introduced several policies green deal etc but what differentiates the display energy certificate for instance from another energy performance certificates which was also introduced the energy epc energy performance certificate is that energy performance certificate takes care of uh, domestic buildings whereas the dec specifically takes care of every single public authority so any building that is frequented by the public, used by the public, exists to serve the public, and is in the interest of the public, is you know liable to have the this the DEC by law. And it's based on actual energy as well as the energy performance, the EPC is based on projected, you know, uh, projected uh, energy use, speculation, speculated energy use. Okay, thank you very much. So the asset rating, the AR, is something which is a hope, and the uh, display energy certificate is, some, is an actuality, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Right. Let's uh, pitch into a, uh, a, a comment, really. Um, and uh, the comment from uh, comes from Antonio in London. Um, and he, he, his, his comment is that the, uh, but, but, but decks don't really, the decks in the UK don't really come from the EPD BD directly. Um, as, as other countries simply comply with uh, requirement of displaying certificates in public buildings by displaying the EPC, the Energy Performance Certificates. The EU directives leave a lot of margin a national transposition so a way that different countries interpret the law and uh, the uh, the UK has made decision using actual energy bills rather than using an energy model for the DEC but that's not an EU requirement apparently yeah like I said the UK was one of the uh, most enthusiastic countries to actually implement the EPBD but like I said, we have to pay attention to the underlying principle, which is transparency, certification rating, and efficiency. So, like I said, in this country, we have the benefit of both the EPC, which works on non-actual energy use, as well as the DEC, which works on actual energy use. And based on my interaction, you know, in my pilot study with stakeholders, whatever deficiencies so far have discovered flaws with the DEC, they actually applaud the facts. And even I, I met uh, in one of the conference presentations I gave colleagues from Australia who applaud the fact that while in some countries they are still working with speculative energy use, the DEC has to be commended for the fact that it actually works with actual energy use. So that's a plus in regards to the DEC. And okay, and uh, Claire also from London uh, writes, uh, as, you, as you've already stated, of course, these are applicable to public buildings. Would making them compulsory for all commercial buildings be beneficial? Yeah, I think there are discussions like, for instance, there have been consultations uh, from, you know, the body formerly known as the uh, Department for Communities and Local Government, now the Ministry of Housing. They put out uh, a wide consultation trying to find out how uh, and also, I think that there was also a recent uh, consultation from the government trying to see how the EPCs as well as the DECs could actually be improved. And I know from stakeholders, one of their concerns is some have to actually put out both EPCs and DECs for the same set of building stocks or buildings in their building stock. So which basically implies some more resources in terms of time, finance, etc involved in actually producing this document. So I think there's still consultations or rather the results or the outcome of the consultations will reveal in which direction because the feeling now both from the government as well as stakeholders is there has to be some sort of uh, compromise. So if you have uh, or prioritizing, so to speak, so if you 
more liable to have a DEC for a building then you might not be necessarily you shouldn't be liable to have an EPC for that okay thank you for that um, okay. uh, Robert from um, Maidstone uh, asks uh, you know just summarizing a question really that you you show some fairly um, worrying statistics about a number of lodgements of uh, DECs is this is this something that uh, that needs to be um, followed up or in some way to make sure that we actually get a more representative view of, of public buildings in the UK and how how would you how would you expect to do that well when it says worrying statistics is that the significance of the the level of uh, non-compliance as I was referring to now a number of a number of buildings have actually been lodged you showed a very small number. oh yeah yes yes yeah yeah so it's quite significant and for instance in the in the um the most recent consultation regarding how to improve epcs i felt it important to actually share my knowledge with the DECs, with the government via the cpc energy performance group so perhaps to sort of uh, uh, create some sort of lessons learned you know just to at least if nothing else to give the government an idea of how significant you know the because like i said we've gone from 20 percent in 2011 to 50 percent two years later and now five years later it's 80 percent even if i stopped at the central government analysis that's significant but to then embark on the sub-regions, for instance, of Northern England, and eventually, if I have the benefit of sharing further um, presentations with you, you now see it, the same story is being told nationally, which is worrying. So it's not like a fluke has occurred at central level or a fluke has occurred in one uh, region or sub-region. There seems to be, so there has to be something, some sort of almost the constant that is responsible for these flaws or whatever uh, factors actually hindering, you know, better performance. And I, like I said, I'm still, as much as I've discovered a lot of first in my study, which I've shared so far via conferences and even via the CBC journal, I still feel, I still feel I have to wait a bit until, like I said, I complete, you know, my entire plan of the analysis, as well as draw up, you know, a comprehensive uh, sets of implications of what I've found, as well as uh, whatever patterns, you know, cut across different areas, and then produce that, and then I'll be in a position, you know, to now share that with the relevant bodies. And so far, the body, for instance, at the government level, I've been interacting with, like I said, is the key body department, formerly known as the Department for Community and Local Government, the DCLG, which is now known as the Ministry for housing so yes definitely um uh, i'm going to share that with the those concerned with the hope of probably coming up with a comprehensive strategy to at least start addressing whatever the problems are finally discovered to be okay um i've got a question here from um uh sardia in uh, caution and uh sardia refers to the getting access to this data so it can be analysed, um, uh, references to the uh, Centre for Sustainable Energy, uh, so you've got a website, cse.org.uk, but holds DEC data. And uh, Sarge says that they only seem to have data up to 2010. Is data available beyond that? Yes, yes. Um... Oh, I've lost you, um, Emeka. I can't actually hear you at the moment. And, and it depends. Can you hear me, Tim? Yeah, I can hear you now, yes. Yes. Uh, so as I was saying, 
instance, my data sets, which I've been working on, is based on data set between 2008 and 2017. So like I said, she should probably consider looking, I don't know if she's aware of the Open Data Communities platform, which holds the bulk data. Okay, well, that would be worth her perhaps... Uh, oh, she can contact, yeah, she can contact me later anyway. Okay, good. Okay, um, right, uh, let's just see where we are now. Um, I've lost lost track of my questions a bit there. Uh, I've got a, another another query uh, on on the on the data it, itself. Uh, how 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 sure are you of this? Is from from Tony in Guildford. Um, yeah. How sure are you of the veracity of a data that you're examining? Uh, like I said, all this is involves law. So the assumption is okay. Like for instance, if we go back to let me see if I can bring up the slide so like i was saying you know that's why it was important to establish the process flow so for what you see on this slide with this figure i have more in-depth uh rows and columns of the process flow in a detailed table and this goes side by side with columns for the process flow so for any identified process flow phase if identify from stakeholders and from analysis a process flaw that goes in red so that one can have a comparative analysis of what should go on and what is actually occurring in practice now the important thing to note is at the point of production the data is made available by the building managers at individual building levels so flaws can occur, occur there because it depends on, like I talked about, you know, the catchment period for data of between 12 to 15 months and replication of data which doesn't reflect actual building energy use or building use activities. So problems could occur there, as well as problems could occur where a situation where the, the relationship between the energy assessor, for instance, and it's his or her accreditation body in regards to lodgement. But what should not go wrong, and the assumption is should not go wrong, is the government, like I said, is the uh, adjudicator, the pilot, so to speak, the champion, the custodian of the legal, the statutory instruments. Like I said, this is a legal, it was transposed into UK law in 2007, amended in 2012. So it's not just um, a free for all. So they are custodians of that you know, directive as they've transposed into law. So they are the ones in charge through a third party for the NDEPC register of non-bulk data through the landmark information group, as well as the open data community platform, which holds the bulk data. So this is handled, like I said, by the former department, the Ministry of uh, Department for Communities and Local Government, now the Ministry of Housing. So the assumption is this government, key government department, handles the data with care. And of course, like if you see with the process, in a situation where um, the reliability of such data is, is, is put into question, there's opportunity, for instance, for that uh, quality, you know, to be checked, complaints to be made prior to the data being reproduced. And then no data is it's quite important to, to, to know this. If there's some sort of deficiency or problem with the data, it cannot be lodged. Or if there's a problem with the way it's been produced, it cannot be lodged. So the assumption is the process has been taken care of in regards ensuring that only reliable data are lodged. And that's why I pointed out that for now, I'm reporting on the quantitative aspects. So I'm, I'm basically stating what's been lodged, what's not been lodged, and comparing to see what should have been lodged and the quantity that hasn't been lodged. By the time I now get into deeper into the whys, you know, the qualitative aspects, the whys, perhaps the assumption is perhaps we might now begin to get clear explanations regarding the reasons for non-lodgement, which could be that somewhere along the line, 
the production process of such DECs and ARs failed. And so they cannot, you know, lodge illegitimate uh, documents. Okay. So I hope that explains. Okay, well, I think that's given people a, a flavour of, 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 of a process. And uh, you've, you've, you've covered the, the, uh, the, the environment of DECs and, and uh, asset ratings in the, in the UK. Um, I think there's lots more to talk about here. And I think internationally, uh, there's a lot of lessons to be, to be learned about the way that this has been uh, um, operated and, and also audited in, in the UK. So, Emeka, thank you for your yeah. for your presentation today. 